Okay, let's go ahead and get started. Um, I think Andy is out there in our audience. Um, we're gonna try to get him uh, here as a panelist, um, but we're gonna go ahead and get started with uh, our special guest today. Thank you everybody for being here. Thanks for joining us. This is our second monthly series. This is our second in a monthly series of Skycatch Mining Industry Roundtable. My name is Michelle Waite from Skycatch and I'm gonna be your host today. Um, if you don't know Skycatch, we were incorporated in 2013. We're a technology provider of high accuracy, automated 3D mapping, surveying and analysis tools for mining, as well as for commercial construction enterprises around the world. So this month, I'm super excited to be speaking with an amazing panel of geologists and geotechnical engineers and we're gonna be talking about their use of um, 3D site data and how it's transformed their work in conjunction with the um, everyday work that they do. Um, some of it is use of drone captured 3D data and some of it can be um, laser captured or, um, but bringing it all together. So just a few logistical things to get started. Uh, number one, as you can tell, this is a Zoom webinar. Um, many of you are probably familiar with Zoom, but if not, if you scroll along the bottom of your screen, you'll see a section that is entitled Q&A as well as chat. Um, feel free to enter any of your questions in the chat or the Q&A, and we will address those as it makes sense. Um, if we don't get to your question, by the end, we'll be sure to follow up um, with answers for you. I have all the attendees on the line today are muted um, so that we can minimize any background noise. This is the best way to interact with, with the group. Finally, we're gonna record, or this, record, this webinar is being recorded and it'll be available on demand after today. We'll send a link in an email after the event if you signed up. If you weren't able to attend today, um, you will have the uh, ability to watch it in the recording. And uh, you, will, you can also share it with others as you feel necessary. So today, our goal is to have an interactive and um, educational conversation about the 3D data and how it's improving mining workflows from a geological as well as a geostructural point of view. So let's get started and let's meet our panelists that are here today. We have Chris Lane. Uh, Chris, if you want to wave so they know who you are. Um, Chris has an uh, HB of Science in Geology, 16 years of experience in exploration, open pit and underground mining in both coal and metals mining. Chris has managed geology as well as geotechnical teams for tech resources over the past seven years and has extensive experience in resource modeling, geological interpretation and geotechnical hazard monitoring and mitigation. Um, I, I had also asked if they, anybody had um, anything interesting that they wanted to share, which is, and Chris shared the fact that he just recently started a small batch coffee roasting business in British Columbia, which is super cool. Um, welcome. Welcome to our panel, Chris. Thanks for being here. Thanks a lot. And we also have Melissa Newton, also from Tech Resources. Um, Melissa has a master's in science from in structural geology, five years of experience in the oil and gas industry, and then two and a half years of experience in open pit coal operations. She's working as a geologist at Tech Line Creek Operations, and her work focuses on planning and executing the exploration program there. And she spends extra time working on geological interpretations of different pits. And the interesting fact that she shared is she had the opportunity to travel to Japan and eat massive amounts of sushi. So I think you're a sushi lover there, Melissa. Thank you for being here as well. Thanks for having me. And finally, we have David Chen. David is the Chief Technology Officer at Skycatch. Since 2014, he's led the development of the Skycatch High Precision Drone Systems and Software used today at mines across the world. And he also holds several key patents related to the use of UAVs in high precision. And welcome, David. Thank you, Michelle. Excited for this discussion. Me too. So let's, let's dig in and get started. Um, first of all, I just thought I would ask you both Chris and Melissa, um, if you wanna kind of set the 
stage for us and um, talk a little bit about the site that you're at, the work and the work that you do and what your, your, your day-to-day looks like. Melissa, maybe you can start. Um, well, I'm currently working at Lion Creek. It has a um, three open pit coal mines going right now. And right now I am helping doing a interpretation for geotech. So trying to do interpret the structures behind the wall in the pit to determine where the faults are and the bedding orientation so they can look at um, trying to make the pit safer and design it to avoid failure. So I'm helping with that while trying to get my drilling program up and running. Awesome. What's going on? (laughs) And Chris, uh, you want to share a little bit about your, your, yourself? Yeah, I, uh, I supervise the geology and the geotech team here at Lion Creek. And uh, yeah, I oversee everything from exploration to mining execution um, and all the safe execution of that. So monitoring high walls, monitoring spoils, and then all the way through to clean coal production through the plant. So yeah, kind of have my hands in a lot of different areas and making sure that it's all uh, done safely and as accurately as possible. Nice. And you both have a geology background from an educational perspective, but Chris, you also get involved at the, on the geotechnical side as well, the engineering side as well. Yeah, that's right. I'm not the geotechnical expert, but I have experience in the in that field and uh, and supervise that group. So through work experience, I've gained gained that uh, skill set. Awesome. So. Um, Chris, maybe can you talk a little bit about um, your team and the types of things that they're working on um, presently, and in particular, um, how 3D data is is kind of integrating into the workflow that you have going on today? Yeah, so like Melissa mentioned, she's uh, working on some geotechnical interpretation, some structural modeling for us. And uh, yeah, what we do is we take all of our typical exploration drilling information that we that we have and we're able to get 3D information to go along with that from from drone scans and it allows us to get a more accurate picture of what we're seeing in an exposed high wall and then project that into the high wall and kind of connect all the information together to get a more accurate 3D representation of what's going on then that information can be used to, to feed geotechnical models and do back analysis or forward looking analysis to understand what kind of challenges we're going to have with stability in an existing wall or in a future wall. And then, yeah, then we can change designs or execute different monitoring strategies to, to keep personnel safe. And, and Melissa, you're, you're directly dealing with the information that's coming in and you're comparing that against or integrating it with um, the information uh, that is then used to do those things. Is that correct? Or can you, can you talk a little bit more about that? Yeah, so with running the exploration program, we drill a number of holes to gather data from geophysical logs. And so I, I kind of get the hands-on data, collect it from the field. And then as Chris mentioned, we use drone scans from the nearby high wall. Um, so think of the drill holes as like straws in the earth. You only get in a little piece of information right where that straw intersects the earth, but there's a lot of space between the straws. So when you have very complicated structural geology, there's a lot of faults and folds and different things that can happen in between all these drill holes that you don't, it's hard to understand. So by getting a drone scan of the nearby high wall, we can figure out exactly where these faults and folds are and what the geometries are. And then we can take those geometries and kind of project them back and then modify them based on what the drill hole data is telling us. So that we can kind of figure out what's going on for great distances into the mountain. And then this year, I'm drilling more holes 
to test the gaps in this model and see how well it did. So it's kind of an iterative process. And, you know, we've mined some more, we'll add in more benches, so you kind of go back and forth, but you know, we have limited data, so you're trying to get everything you can. So drone scans, field mapping, everything gets incorporated into this model, which then, as Chris mentioned, feeds into geotech you know, spillage analysis, into pit design, and into a lot of different aspects that help us plan how we're going to mine this safely. Before there was a use of drone scans, what were some of the techniques for measuring, taking measurements on a high wall for these kind of analysis? <laughs> for, the last, for the last 10 years, we haven't been able to access high walls. So we've always had like a minimum distance that we need to stay away from the wall. Um, yeah, so we would use LIDAR scans and things like that, different technologies to try and get that information. Um, one of the drawbacks with that technology is, is just the turnaround time and sometimes the, the reliability of what that, that instrument can actually see. Um, and then other methods prior to that would have been to, to get right on the wall and put a compass on there and take some actual measurements. But this allows us to do it more safely, which is, uh, which is the biggest piece yeah. for me at least. Gotcha. And how, sorry, how tall can these uh, high walls get? So that, yeah, they, they can be a couple hundred meters tall, if not more, depending on, on where you're at. So in terms of the past versus the, so I guess what new information do you have or what has that done for, for your data um, or for the people who are using your data, I guess the pit planners and, and others, what does that ability get that they did not have in the past because of your inability to, to get up close to the high wall? I would say the biggest thing is confidence, right? Before, you know, you're trying to guesstimate roughly where that fault is. Well, with the drone data, and especially if you use photographs as well, you can figure out exactly where it is. And I can draw it on the drone scan and bring that in as a 3D object into my model. So I have very good confidence in where these features are which you wouldn't have before unless you could physically get up there and measure it, which yeah. is and not safe. When you say you're bringing it into the model, where are you bringing that into and, and, and who else is accessing that information? Uh, so I've been bringing it um, from, like the drone scan gets brought into Point Studio, formerly known as EyeSight. And that's where I do the interpretation on the drone scan. And I create all these lines that represent faults and folds and cool seams and, and different things. And then I've been bringing that into MindSight. So MindSight's where I do this massive 3D interpretation of what's going on tied to the drill holes. It's kind of like a step process to incorporate it, but I just have more confidence in where my features are. Um, and then as Chris said, the turnaround time. You know, survey can get a drone scan and process it by the next day. Versus, a, um, sorry. Sorry, go ahead. I was going to gonna ask. Er, oh, sorry. So um, earlier you mentioned that uh, you're now kind of drilling more holes to confirm whether those projections were accurate. How have you found the data that you've um, projected from the drone scans to, to match actual drill hole measurements? Uh, well, like the, the drone scan is one surface and then my drill hole could be a hundred meters or more into the mountain. So that's a big gap when it, we have very complicated structure. So I know the structure is gonna change between where I have the drone scan and the hole. And so I actually take the drone scan and, cut, and look at where the hole data is telling me and then I modify it slightly. And I use the geometries and the fault placements and modify it to match what the drill hole data is telling me. And so the structure will kind of morph along trend. Gotcha. So, yeah, they're kind of feeding into each other to help figure out what's going on. But yeah, some of, the, some of the ways we've used the data is in uh, two-dimensional numerical modeling. 
for stability analysis and doing back analysis of actual failures on the wall that have happened. And we've been able to build those models and recreate exactly what happened with the failure. And then that kind of reflects that, that interpretation that we're projecting from that, that uh, 3D scan is actually really, really useful and really, really accurate. So can, can you talk about that again? So you have um, a previous one that may have failed and you're, you're taking the data and using that data to then project what will or will not work for future high walls? Is that, is that, am I hearing that accurately? That's right. So we can take the, the failure that occurred, build a model based off of the interpretation work that Melissa does, gain an understanding of why that, that certain piece of the wall failed understand what led to that, get an idea of how accurate the geology is in that wall, and then we can start to project the, the future failures that potentially could happen, or maybe the wall is going to be stable as well after that. But it, it, it allows us to do those checks and have confidence in that. Very interesting. So um, who are you dealing with, Melissa, when you're on a daily basis to get this information to them, and how are they using it? Um, well, yeah, so once I get the interpretation done, it gets fed into a couple of different people. So one is Geotech uses it for the pit stability analysis. We also send it to um, the engineers that look at pitch hull design. So we want to figure out based on what the coal seams are and their thickness and everything, what's going to be economic or not. So this model gets given to them so they can work up the economics and a business decision can be de determined if we want to go forward or not. So it gets fed into them and, you know, they'll tweak the design based on the economics and based on what geotech is telling them to make sure that the pit walls are at an angle where they won't fail and be a safety hazard. Um, and it also gets fed into reserve and resources modeling. Right? We need to know how much reserves and resources are at Lion Creek for investors and for planning purposes. So it, it does get fed to multiple different people for different types of analysis. Very interesting. Um, Chris, anything to add to that from, um, from your perspective across the, the team? No, I mean, we, we're talking a lot about high walls, but we also use it in uh, various areas around the site. So we look at our, our waste dumps so we can look at where we have cracking and things like that in our waste dumps. We can look at differences in, in uh, different surfaces from one month to another or some, some different time period and get an idea of scale of movement and where the movement's happening. And yeah, I think there's a lot of different ways that we can use the data. So yeah, it, we impact our survey group, our engineering group, our geotechnical group, and then we feed consultants with really accurate information as well. Can you speak a little bit about the consultants? I, I know that prior to this, we, we talked about that on the phone a little bit, but um, like when you're, what are you doing with the consultants and how are you working with them with this information? So yeah, Melissa, she like, she does a really uh, in-depth uh, structural modeling in our, uh, in our modeling software. And then that gets sent to uh, as like a DXF, for instance, to our consultants, and then they'll bring it into their modeling software, and, and they run a number of different analysis just to understand the the rock mechanics, how the wall is going to perform, and how it's going to move. And the three, the data on the positioning is what is used with the three D data or the drone scans that they have. They're able to bring those two together. And it, does it make their job any different? They're not looking at it in three dimensions. It, we're using it in three dimensions. And then for the work that we've been using it for, it's actually 2D analysis. Okay. Yeah. Okay, interesting. Yeah, David, you look like you had, I'm sorry, go ahead, Melissa. I was gonna say for those analysis, it's very critical on the angle of the fold and formation contacts and bedding. So having more confidence in where these things are and what's going on at the surface helps you understand what's going on in the subsurface. So I'm hearing the word confidence a lot, giving you confidence 
the is the yeah. <laughs> the key, I think. Yeah. And and it's so, not yeah. So you 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 need all of this information together, but it, the drone data or the scan data is giving you the confidence to know that what you're seeing is actually what you're seeing. Yeah. Yeah. So just I'll just throw this out there that we talked about how you used to collect the data and all that kind of thing and putting a compass on a wall. I find that the quality of the the drone imagery and the 3D scans that we get now is way more reliable than if I was to actually be standing out in the field. You always need that piece where you go and look at it in the field to kind of ground truth it and understand what you're dealing with. But the level of detail that you can get out of the, the scans is superior to even being in the field, which is crazy to talk about. <laughs> Awesome. Uh, I was curious, has there been any instances where um, having seen drone data and performing some analysis, it has you know, caused you to catch some major issue or has made a, a large change in your plans that you know, if otherwise would have led to other issues to come up later? Yeah, there's, there's potential for that. So we're in the Rocky Mountains and in Canada and we get lots of snow through the winter and we all know the walls are moving even through the winter, even though you can't see it really. So certain areas we know they're moving and we've got radars and things like that monitoring that. Um, but when the snow melts, if you can't get to an area on foot, we can go and fly with a drone and we can find all sorts of cracking that may have developed through the winter, which otherwise you, you may not have caught until you actually had a piece of material come down. So we just did a scan last week where we found some of that. So investigations are ongoing with that information as we speak, but yeah, it's very useful that way. How big are these cracks that you're picking up in, um, in a wall that's moving? It depends how long it's been moving. So you could have over a winter, you could have a, a crack that forms that could be a meter or a half meter wide by half meter to a meter tall, just depending what the situation's like. Hopefully you're not seeing that, but. <laughs> <laughs> what kind of actions could you take if you catch these issues happening? So if you, if you didn't know that that was happening and you find it, then that allows us to slightly proactively get uh, monitor different monitoring systems on that wall to watch it in real time. And that allows us to, put trigger action response plans and things like that together so that we can react to like larger scale movement and, and understand the rates that are happening. Um, you could, gotcha. you might evacuate people out of there until you understand that as well. And then put an evac or an exclusion zone below the area. Yeah, that makes sense. It could be a massive safety hazard if a huge boulder was about to crack and come up, um, come down onto the lower parts. Yeah. That's right. It looks like Andy was able to join. Yeah, yeah. So um, <laughs> I think, you know, it was interesting because um, in, pr in preparing for this call, we were talking about the different types of work that um, specifically Melissa and Andy were doing. Andy is an exploration geologist um, with Nevada Gold Mines. Uh, he focuses on the Turquoise Ridge District in Nevada. Um, he spent both time in both open pits and underground environments on project development and brownfield exploration. I think when we were talking earlier, Melissa, you were mainly focused on going out and my, you know, in an exploration mode on a new wall that you wanted to get a pit plan for. Whereas Andy, maybe you can speak a little about the project that you were involved with, with high wall um, mining um, and uh, what what that involved and um, and how you use the 3D data there? Yeah. So can you guys hear me, all right? Uh, yeah. If you can speak a little louder, maybe. Okay. Um, yeah, I'm using my computer audio. So it, I was following along with this. So we did a kind of a different uh, approach to using the skycast data, and we had a very set of specific set of questions that we wanted to answer. Um, it was really focused on uh, enhancing and augmenting um, areas of low conf confidence data in historic pits. So 
we had some historic pits that, uh, like I said, had some missing data. So we came up with a plan where we wanted to um, go in, fly specific areas, capture that data. Um, we set out to have five five centimeter resolution. Uh, we had a set time frame, and for us, was the, the big thing was the integration into different software platforms, which was Leapfrog, uh, ArcGIS, ArcGIS, and ArcGIS Pro. So we worked with David, his team, um, set up a schedule, flew these high walls. Uh, I think we did uh, just under 200 or 200 or 300 acres in about uh, two days. We flew it. We processed the data, um, worked with David and his team to be able to incorporate all this data, set it into LeapFrog into uh, a format that made LeapFrog happy. Because LeapFrog can get kind of temperamental when you do high resolution imagery and large uh, image sets in LeapFrog. So then we took that data. Uh, we integrated with all of our other drilling sets, so all of our exploration data, blast hole data, pit map data, uh, geotechnical data, every single data set that we had in LeapFrog, uh, added context to the whole thing, uh, made our geologic interpretations from that, and then fed that back into mine scale models, regional models, district models, um, and then used that to do target generation, um, and, and other things in the district. So uh, in comparison to some of the other projects that we talked about, uh, our project wasn't really directly involved in the production aspect. It was really filling in big data gaps that uh, uh, were kind of uh, weak. And have you done that type of work in other areas as well? Or was it, uh, besides just using drone data, but having to do something like this on another mine or in another area? Uh, no, this is our, this is our first uh, first uh, kind of project using this technology. We've used total station uh, mapping before, where you set up basically a geotechnical gun, I guess we can call it, and you you set a fixed location to resect your uh, position in, and then you actually look through a sighting glass and shoot in geologic contacts or faults or. Uh, other geologic features in the pit, and then you take that data and you have to convert it into different software packages and then get it to where you can use it in different um, um, software platforms. But this was really easy in the sense that we, we laid out our project specifics and then um, we executed and we got the products that we wanted um, uh, within the time frame we wanted. So everything was in our the core depth system that we wanted, um, and it was in the resolution that we that we requested. Gotcha. We have a question that came in, and I think Chris, you answered it from your perspective, but from Luke, any experience? So Andy, do you have any experience monitoring waste rock dumps that have been revegetated? Uh, I have not. Um, I think it would be possible. I, I just, uh, I'm, I'm a little bit removed from the, the reclamation aspects. Gotcha. And then Chris's answer was not specifically, but it could be incorporated into a monthly or quarterly review to understand long-term movements. We've used this on waste dumps that have not been reclaimed and have been able to compare to previous flights to understand scale and location of movement. Did you want to add anything to that, Chris? Uh, no. No, I think that that covers it. I don't okay. see an issue. I guess it depends what vegetation you've put on it, but you 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 uh, probably still get a sense of that movement. I see what uh, Luke is asking. He has a follow up. Are bare ground surfaces easily obtained from photogrammetry? That's a really great question, and we get that a lot from our customers, um, especially in areas that have been either some sparse vegetation or densely vegetated. So the, the problem with photogrammetry is that it can only reconstruct what the cameras can see. So if there's some vegetation, that's what it's gonna reconstruct. We do have uh, post-processing systems that removes non-ground objects. So if there's trees or bushes that can be removed, but if it's kind of dense, um, photogrammetry has issues. However, the upcoming solutions that we will be supporting for the, the M300 is um, the L1 sensor, which is a 
a LIDAR capture system that, that has triple return. So to, to use something like that over uh, a waste rock dump that has a lot of vegetation growing over it, we would be able to actually get a pretty accurate model of the, the terrain surface beneath the vegetation. Hope that uh, answers your question. Do, um, and I guess along that line and, and speaking of the future, I'd love to hear from the three panelists on sort of where you see things going. What are new technologies in, in the world of geology and geotechnical engineering that you're really super excited about and, um, and see, see um, a lot of, in it? yeah. So Melissa, maybe you can go first. Um, yeah, so for me, like, for getting the information we need, you know, geological mapping is very important. Well, when you have mountainsides, it's hard to get everywhere. So if we can fly drones, you can find outcrop, and then we can target those areas for either somebody to go in and go hands-on look at the outcrop, or maybe the drone can get close enough to get the info we need to save somebody walking a couple kilometers to get in there. Gotcha. Um, access, so access is a big deal for you and having technologies that give you access. Yeah, and then with planning exploration programs, drone scans can help me look at, you know, the slope and some of those aspects to help me plan where I'm going to put my roads or my pads or, you know, if we reuse historic pads. You know, I plan the program in the winter. If I have a drone scan from the summer, I can take a look at what it looks like and I have an idea of how much effort it's going to be to fix up these historic pads and roads and, and reuse them so it can help on the planning side which gets fed into permitting and, and everything. So, there, besides yeah. the drone, the drone type scans, is it, are there any other technologies out there today and AI or machine learning that you're seeing from a geology perspective that looks interesting to you? Or Chris, I mean, if you have any thoughts on that, maybe. We're, we're always looking for downhole information. We, we drill thousands of blast holes every day. So, um, looking at different technologies to get real-time data back from our drills and understand what we're seeing in the ground. And then correlating that with the data that we're capturing on the surface is a, is a big thing for us. Gotcha. Yeah. Um, Andy, how about you? And I'm sorry, Melissa, you wanted to say something? I was just going to say with, you know, helping on permitting the environmental side, you know, I'm curious about some of the different types of remote sensing data. It's available and if that could help understand, you know, where's white bark pine or some of these other at risk species that to help planning and avoid them and incorporate that into the environmental plans we put together. Gotcha. Yeah, I think there's going to be a lot of focus on the environmental side of things, especially going forward. And um, we hope to do a lot more of these sessions that have discussions specifically on that. So um, if anybody out there has any new unique information they want to share on that aspect. I'd, um, all ears, thank you. Um, Andy, anything from you on um, the future and anything that's getting you excited um, you know, from a geological perspective or just mining in general, technology wise? Uh, yeah, so the coming back to that vegetation, um, picking up vegetation versus from ground or underserved ground, um, Esri and their new uh, Arc Pro platform has some new machine learning algorithms that can pick out um, certain plant species or it can do identification of different um, items on the ground. So this has been really big inside uh, cities to look for uh, infrastructure. So there's a new algorithm that, like I said, that uh, Esri has developed that can do, um, can start recognizing uh, ground-based uh, objects um, and then the other one I'm kind of uh, keeping my eye, eye on is um, uh, drone-based hyperspectral and drone-based uh, aerial mag. So flying high resolution, small area aerial mag over certain areas. Um, instead of having like, like a fixed wing, if it's fixed winged aircraft fly these huge, huge areas, you can do um, small scale localized, uh, like I said, uh, hyperspectral or, or some sort of airborne geophysics. Very interesting. And, and David, I know that you, you kind of, from an R&D perspective, are constantly looking at all these new technologies that are coming out. And any, um, anything that you've seen that gets you excited? 
Yeah, absolutely. I think um, I've been looking at the LiDAR space for many years um, and it's always been just slightly out of reach due to price and how large these systems are. But I'm finally seeing that the cost and size and performance is becoming um, small enough and low cost enough that it can start to replace some of the standard survey use cases with drones. Um, one of the, I think I mentioned earlier, the, the L1 sensor from DJI, that's gonna be out this year and compatible with uh, the M300 series. That's actually uh, looks extremely interesting. It's small and it can capture terrain really rapidly. So one of the benefits is you now eliminate the need for long periods of processing for photogrammetry, whereas you capture the data, you do a quick post-processing and you have your 3D point clouds. And also it's fully colorized because it has an integrated 20 megapixel camera on it. Um, so that's super exciting. Uh, the other things that I'm excited about are other flight platforms. So for example, I think someone mentioned um, fixed wing platforms. Um, so there's a, a number of really good, uh, so I guess, let me back up a bit. So fixed wings have been around for serving for a while. However, the, the biggest problems with fixed wings is the landing. Uh, and if you have ever worked with a fixed wing aircraft, that's a belly lander, uh, you know that after a couple landings on a mining site, it's gonna be completely torn up. So now there's a number of really nice VTOL systems that can take off from anywhere, just like a multi-rotor and give you 60 to 90 minutes, some even two hours of flight time. So you can potentially map your entire mine in a single flight <laughs> at a high altitude. So that's, that's really exciting. Nice. That's awesome. Yeah. We had a question come in, um, and, and I think I, 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 maybe you guys can answer this. Um, David, I know you can, but um, mm -hmm. from, a, from the end user perspective, do you use ground control points or RTK, and how do you assess the accuracy in your 3D model or your 3D mapping? So Andy, do you, have any, do you use GCPs or RTK, and how do you assess the accuracy? So uh, yeah, we did the we did both. So we did when we set up our our program, we did GCP. So I had a high resolution differential GPS, and I went out and set up the GCPs before the flight. And the the drone unit itself did have RTK. We set the GCP for just as an accuracy post processing. And when we loaded the the GCPs into the model and then draped over the the imagery. Um, they were, they were right there. They were, they were right on. So I think if David, is that correct? Did you, the RTK system was what you used primarily, but we used the GCP as the backup. Right. So That's more to, to, to check your accuracy. Yeah. And I mean, you can zoom in as close as you want to do with leapfrog and you're always going to have that centimeter, or, you know, very, very, very small difference, but from the, from, uh, from an accuracy standpoint on the mine scale, it's minuscule. Yeah, and yeah. I wanna add that, oh, sorry, um, that uh, all the systems that we work with are using either RTK or PPK and the GCPs are nice to have in the field for verification, but for a lot of scenarios, for example, the mapping of a high wall, it's gonna be impossible to send someone up there to set up GCP. So you need a reliable way to capture this accurately without GCPs. And, and uh, we worked on a number of years on systems that can produce less than five centimeters of absolute accuracy in all axes. Chris or Melissa, are you, I mean, I'm assuming you guys are similar in how. Um, yeah, we, we uh, when we started out, when we started out a couple of years ago, we were using the ground control points. And then over the last couple of years, we've moved away from it. Just, uh, just more accuracy without them. And, and uh, yeah, we don't, we just don't use them anymore. Gotcha. Have you done any comparison between another question from Mohammed, any comparison between point clouds for LIDAR and photogrammetry? I can answer this. So 
Um, we haven't done any yet. However, uh, I'm actually going out into the field this week to perform some some initial captures with the L1 system, and we'll be sharing some comparisons as we as we capture data. So we have a, a test site that's a rock quarry up in Northern California that we, we do a lot of these testing at. So to be determined. <laughs> um, somebody is asking about um, VTOL. Anybody have experience? Um, is that a question or is it just stating that VTOL is VTOL, coming? Yeah. <laughs> I, just had, I just said VTOL. Um, Looks like David, is there a question in our Q&A as well? Oh yeah, there's a one There's one open question uh, from Preston Miller to Melissa and Chris. What would you consider to be the biggest value driver from the additional accuracy and flexibility of drone survey? Reduction in drilling, higher recovery, lower dilution? <laughs> yeah, I, I, I don't think you're gonna reduce your drilling for sure, but... Uh... Yeah, I'd say there's potential for higher recovery. Um, we can use it uh, bench by bench to scan surfaces and understand a bench by bench scale exactly where the, the coal or the ore is sitting. Um, and there is potential on the, the dilution piece as well. Um, yeah, I think all of those kind of impacted and there's on a on a coal recovery standpoint too we're able to reconcile our full high walls with this data as well so we can compare the design to the actual results and see if our bench fa bench face angles are correct or if we need to make a change and steepen up or shallow out get more stability actually executing proper catch benches um, if we were able to verify some of those parameters that we use in our designs then we could potentially steepen walls and increase recovery that way as well. Any advice for somebody who's just kind of looking at um, using 3D data and integrating it into their um, geology and geotechnical programs, any advice from all three of you on how to start or what they should be thinking about or things that you've learned that um, can be avoided? One thing I found is the drone data does well, but sometimes if there's overhangs or something, you don't capture parts of it. So I had to go back and look at pictures taken throughout the mining process and use those with the drone scan to identify some of the smaller scale features and some of those areas where the drone wasn't able to capture it as well. Mind you, this was our first kick at the bucket at doing this type of work. And I know survey has worked on optimizing the process. So it might be better next time, but at this point, especially if you're just starting, take pictures as you're mining. So you have views right onto the outcrop versus at weird angles to help you understand what's going on. Thank you. I think Chris. from my perspective, yeah, I think from my perspective, just uh, budgeting for people's time to sit down and get into the data because there's lots of it and there's lots of different things you can pull out from it. So you can use it to map large scale features like we're talking about here, but you can, you can use it to map small joint sets and things on your wall to also just gain that knowledge on the parameters you're using in your geotechnical models and things like that. So huge amount of time to get a lot of data potentially. So just budgeting for people's time and, and make sure you got the personnel to do it. And do you find that people that are coming out of school now have this knowledge already coming into the job or is this something that they're having to learn about still on the job? Probably a little bit of both, yeah. Okay, okay. Probably don't have the specific experience, but more tech savvy to, to manage it. <laughs> got it, got it. Yep, makes sense. Um, any, any advice that you would give to somebody who's looking at... Um, integrating this into their uh, geological data? Um, yeah, so for me, I would have, I would have tried to fly earlier in the year. Um, so we, as the seasons change, the, the image of your high wall changes. So if you have a wet spring, you have nice clean high walls. Um, 
when we flew later in the summer, you start getting some alteration in the walls and you don't always get a clear picture of the geology compared to, like I said, if I flew in the spring. Um, lighting is a huge issue. Um, leaf fog can overcome some of those issues by adjusting the camera angles. But uh, I would, like I said, I would, have, I would have flown earlier in the year when I had the cleanest high walls. Gotcha. David, there's a chat that came in. Do you want to uh, address yeah, that? Yeah, sure. I see a question from Courtly. Uh, the, the question is, typical drone mapping flights performed in a horizontal flight patterns. How does SkyCatch capitalize on effectively capturing data in the more vertical plane of a high wall? Uh, that's a great question. So what we've done uh, differently for our high wall capture uh, system is we are not just flying a flat lawnmower pattern over the terrain that the camera pointed to. Uh, as a part of the workflow, we actually first generate and ingest a the fed uh, data that's existing from uh, that's existing for the site, or we could perform a high level flight and process that in the field and generate that uh, DTM very rapidly. And from that terrain model, we then generate a, a much more complex 3D flight pattern that hugs the wall at the exact distance uh, to capture the proper GSC that you're looking for. And not only are we following the wall, we're also dynamically adjusting the camera gimbal angle. So it's always pointed at the wall, regardless of what the angle is. So once we process the model, we have uh, really good data that's, that's sharp and captures all of the details. And uh, as we improve that, I think we'll also fix some of the issues that you might have seen before from areas where there could be overhangs or things that are obscured when you're looking at it from the top down. Got it. Um, and then there was another item in the chat and I think I'll there's probably more detail and discussion that needs to go into it than mm -hmm. we have time for. But um, I think the gist of it is, is there you know, plans or has anybody been involved um, in, in needing millimeter level accuracy um, for the work that you do? So Melissa, do you, are you, you're not, are you looking at, at at what level or what level of accuracy is important to you in the work that you do as um, a geologist and a structural geologist? Um, the more accurate, the better, because there is small scale st structures and fractures and joint sets that could be important. Um, and that's partly why I ended up using pictures to kind of fill in some of the gaps with the data we had from the drone scan. But I'll use what I can get because it's better than right. I <laughs> Gotcha. Yeah, um, I think, I think uh, like centimeter scale, tens of centimeters for the work we're doing for some of the stability analysis is probably accurate enough. When we get into monitoring, monitoring walls for stability and things like that, that's where millimeter accuracy comes in and, and more fixed systems to, to kind of watch that and get that real-time view of things. Gotcha. Any, any thoughts yeah, no, from your wanna, perspective? Yeah, go ahead, David. Sure, I wanna add uh, to, to answer Ian's question um, about the need for millimeter uh, level accuracy. I think, um, I think what you mean is extremely accurate uh, re repeated captures of a site not necessarily absolute accuracy. And um, this is something that can be done by uh, doing alignment from previous data sets to uh, subsequent data sets during the photogrammetry process by using previous features to, to aid in the bundle adjustment process. And that's something that we have the ability to do because um, we, we own the, the photogrammetry pipeline and we can build build these additions. And that's actually something that we do have a, a patent out for, which is um, detecting changes over time and using previous data sets for the registration and alignment. Uh, I do believe that you're correct that the, the processing time 
um, maybe longer. However, it depends on what is the frequency you really need to do these. Uh, if the deformation is something that you can monitor on a weekly basis, this is definitely uh, a possibility that we can do. And, and yeah, it would definitely be a, a automated process. So when you, when you process a new data set, um, not only is it using PPK or RTK data, it also takes in a previous data sets and it'll find features with the highest confidence that match the new data set and generate the output that's perfectly aligned to the previous one. Thanks, David. And, and Andy, do you have any further comments or anything from an accuracy perspective from the work that you've been doing? Uh, not really. The, again, when we got our five centimeter resolution data, anything, anything under five centimeters, you should be up, in my opinion, you should be out in the field measuring. So from working at your desk, five centimeters is, is a luxury, I guess. <laughs> Awesome. Well, um, we're kind, we're getting to the top of the hour. I think there are, are there any other questions that we might field in one minute there, David, that are on there? Yeah, there's a question from Vern about for the Explorer one, there's oblique and ADR. How does that work with gimbal only airframes? So I think um, with the new M300, there is a new P1 payload, which is designed for photogrammetry and it can shoot at, uh, I think, up to five FPS. Well, that's not necessary. It uh, does enable it to shoot in a mode where as it's flying, the gimbal can dynamically adjust rapidly. So you're capturing both nadir and obliques during uh, the same flight. So instead of two cameras shooting simultaneously, it's just one shooting, but moving back and forth quickly. Answer. Yeah. Okay. Well Oh, Go ahead. sorry. Oh, the, the next question, any idea if the MS cameras can improve our 3D? Uh, what does MS stand for? Marvin, if you could type that in the chat. I think what we, it we may need to do, what we may sorry. need to Go do ahead, is Michelle. follow up on some of these questions. Um, we have one minute at the top of the hour here and I, I wanna be um, cognizant of everybody's time. I appreciate all of our panelists for, for spending an hour with us and spending, um, oh, Michelle, I think we us. lost you. Oh, I've Can still you got me? you, Michelle. I do too. Okay. Okay, cool. Um, so anyway, technical issues today, uh, galore. Um, but, um, hopefully you guys and everybody on the call were able to, to um, hear what everybody had to say. I want to, Thank everybody for being here today. Um, this again was part of our regular roundtable series that we'll be doing on a monthly basis. Um, our next series or our next panel will take place on July 13th and we'll be talking about tailings and out of the box thinking around tailings. So this has been a topic that um, we've been hearing a lot about from the industry. Um, touches a little bit on the environmental side of things that you were you were mentioning earlier, Melissa, um, but also um, in some other areas as well. So we will be doing that on July 13th. I will be sending the link to everyone after this event. So if you're interested in signing up for that, um, uh, we'll see you there. And otherwise, thank you, everybody. <laughs>